There it is. What? It stopped. It was there and then it stopped. It was there loudly for a second. Thanks. Good. No, it was there for a second, then it stopped. Did it loud? turn up? One. Huh? Are you not getting any audio? It keeps on, it keeps on, um, it, like freezing, so I can't keep playing that video. I, I don't want to necessarily play the entire slideshow at this point. Good idea. Why don't, here, if you want to try just an audio, it should play whether we display it or not, right? So it should play through here. Um, let's just play some of these. That worked. That worked. So is it just when it's on slideshow mode that it doesn't work? Uh, you can go to the slideshow here. Yeah, that worked. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, okay. you just have to push, uh, click forward, and one of those, and you get play. No, no, I was playing the video before. I just couldn't, uh, and I could hear a very faint sound. It wasn't that I couldn't hear any song or that it wasn't playing. Okay. It was that it froze, and even when it was playing, I didn't hear the. I could hear the audio, but very faintly. Can you speak into your mic? I'm to... Okay, how about that? Uh, I'm to adjust it back here. I know. I'm, yep, there's some wires, but... How's that? <clears throat> how close do you need me to be to the mic? Is that okay? That volume? Okay. What's that? You want me to keep talking? Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm still talking a little bit. I can talk louder. Tell me if you need to keep me talking, speaking. No? OK. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. I think our technical difficulties have been resolved, hopefully. Um, hello. My name is Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the curator of modern and contemporary art here at the Ulrich. 
And I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of myself and Jenna Irwin, who is in the back there, who is our head of education and organized this event, and the entire Ulrich staff. I see Ranjit over here. There we go. <laughs> um, so today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alice Boyle, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biology and who I think is taller than me <laughs> um, at Kansas State University. So when Jana and I began to talk about the programming that would accompany Look, It's Daybreak, Dear, Time to Sing, which was in the galleries behind you, and which I hope you'll go and look at if you haven't had a chance to do so yet, um, it quickly became evident to us how important it would be to incorporate the knowledge and the perspectives of actual scientists working with bird populations. The artists who created this exhibition, Richard Ibke and Marilu Lemons, as well as um, the curator, Sylvie Fortin, um, all told us about how important it was for them to talk to scientists in Canada, where all three of them are from, and in Nebraska, where this project was first developed. And it was really those conversations with scientists that helped them to a significant degree to understand the complexity of human relationships to birds. So in the exhibition, you'll see several videos that capture the painstaking work that scientists do to track bird populations and to, to save species from extinction in cases where the actions of other humans have endangered them. And so when we were programming here in Kansas, we were incredibly fortunate to come across the work of Dr. Alice Boyle, who has been studying bird populations for nearly 20 years, has published her research widely in professional journals, and runs a lab at K-State focused on researching birds with a particular emphasis, and I hope I'm getting this right, Alice, on their migration and its connection to climate patterns and other ecological factors. In a fascinating twist, it also turns out that um, Alice is also Canadian, so it is particularly appropriate to have her speak in conjunction with this exhibition. Um, she's also a, a scientist who makes a real effort uh, to make her research accessible to um, non-professional, uh, to non-professionals, to people outside of academia. And we're really grateful to her for having accepted our invitation to come speak at an art museum um, to an audience of non-scientists. And we're very pleased to have this uh, opportunity and to continue to try and make the Elrich a place where our audiences can come and encounter research from all kinds of fields that you may or may not typically associate with the fine arts and the visual arts. So today, Dr. Boyle will speak to us about some of her research about um, a prairie bird's love-hate relationship with humans, and I feel certain that hearing her speak will enrich our relationship both to the art on view and to the birds that we encounter in our daily lives. Before I pass the mic over to her, I just wanna thank the donors who generously supported the Ulrich presentation of Look It's Daybreak, Dear Time to Sing and its associated programming. Um, they include Steve Overstreet in memory of James Sproul, Don and Ellie Skoken, who we see in the audience, uh, Keith and Georgia Stevens, Dr. Guy and Carol Glidden, and Dr. Pat Purvis. And we're also very grateful to the Bemis Center for, Con uh, for Contemporary Arts, the Canada Council for the Arts, and please forgive my French, the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec for their support of the exhibition. So as we typically do, we'll, we'll have Dr. Boyle speak for about 45 minutes, at which point we'll open the floor up for Q&A, and then there will be a reception. Please stay for the reception and for the noshing and the socialization and for the exhibition. And um, with that, I'll stop talking and invite Alice here. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. I want to thank Sylvia Fortin for originally reaching out to me and to the whole staff of the Ulrich Museum who've made all this possible, including some last minute technical um, shenanigans. Just goes to show working between artists and scientists, a lot of scientists use PCs and a lot of artists use Macs and causes problems. So <laughs> thank you for your patience. Um, as uh, it was mentioned, I'm a professor, an associate professor at Kansas State University. Um, I study birds. I've loved birds for a long time, and but I didn't start um, my career in birds. I actually 
started my career in music, um, playing viola in Costa Rica in the Costa Rica National Symphony. And for many years, I researched tropical birds. And it wasn't till I moved to the beautiful Great Plains of Kansas. I actually grew up in Winnipeg, which is part of the Great Plains, but I didn't study grassland birds until I moved here nine years ago. And I found myself in the heart of this gorgeous landscape, the Flint Hills. And what a lot of people don't realize is that this is the last big chunk of tall grass prairie in the entire world. And we have this amazing opportunity to, as scientists who live here, to explore that, to study it, to contribute to the conservation of the birds that make the tall grass prairies their home. And so since I moved here in 2012, I've been working on grassland bird ecology and conservation. And so um, I was invited to speak about um, birds, art, humans, their intersection, all those things in conjunction with this talk and not, or this exhibit, pardon me, called Look, It's Daybreak, Dear, Time to Sing. And I didn't, I did speak with the artists and I looked at some of the videos and some of the previous work and the materials associated with the, the uh, exhibition in Nebraska. But other than that, I was pretty much given free reign as to what I would talk about today. So I'm going to start by think, presenting what I think of when that title comes up. You can't hear it all that well, but what you see is an eastern meadowlark at dawn scolding because probably Sarah, who was my student who took this video, was a little bit too close to a nest. Um, but in the background, if you could hear it better, you might hear Bob White. You might hear another eastern meadowlark singing, grasshopper sparrows singing perhaps, and um, some dick thistles because they're everywhere. And so that sets the stage. Um, <clears throat> What I wanted to do is delve into the title and what the ways that my biologist brain starts to think about that title in the context of spending my mornings watching those birds and listening to those birds sing on the prairie. So I'm going to pick apart that title a little bit from my perspective. And we're going to start with the singing part. Um, <clears throat> Look, it's daybreak, dear, time to sing. What is that singing? Who does it? Why do they do it? Um, what does it mean? And so we'll talk a little bit about why birds sing and who sings. Um, first, who sings? I'm going to play you some of the common archetypal songs of the prairie here. Hopefully you can hear them. Um, There's an eastern meadowlark, um, one of the most common sounds on the prairie. Um, there's a dick sissel singing its, its name, dick sissel, it's onomatopoeic. Um, one of my favorites, grasshopper sparrow. You actually hear two song types there that come important later. Um, and there's the song of brown-headed cowbirds, um, a fascinating species that lays its eggs in the nests of other species. <clears throat> so these are all what are called true songbirds. They belong to the group of birds. About half the birds in the world are what we call passerines or perching birds. And about three quarters of those are the ossine passerines, the songbirds. And they have a special structure in their and instead of vocal cords, they have a syrinx, and that syrinx is structured in such a way that they can produce these, these amazing sounds. They actually have the equivalent of two um, uh, vocal cords. They can sing duets with them, and if you slow down some of those songs, you can actually hear the two songs at the same time. Um, other than songbirds, other, lots of other birds make vocalizations other than songbirds, but um, they aren't true song. But some of those vocalizations are really familiar to us. So we'll start with um, this one. Maybe you guys recognize that one, killdeer. They're one of the first sounds of spring, um, one of the first birds that starts making a lot of noise when they come back from migration. Um, 
If you've been out to the Quivira or Cheyenne Bottoms reserves, you might have come across this one. Gluck. Gluck. I love those. Those are American bitterns. They're very secretive, but um, awesome sound. And then um, one of our archetypal prairie birds, the greater prairie chickens. They're actually making vocalizations um, and then also making some sounds using those bright orange air pouches they've got inflated there in this in this um, picture. And so those are examples of, of sounds, but not true song. <clears throat> um, why let's let's look at the temporal component. Look, it's daybreak, dear, time to sing. So they're singing to communicate, and I should have said that, but why do they do it so early in the morning? Um, many of us sometimes wish that maybe they didn't do it quite so early. Um, uh, even the biologists, you have to study them. My students and I get very tired of getting up at four in the morning in the summer. Um, so why sing so early in the daybreak, in the morning? Um, that is a reason, like many things in biology, there's often more than one reason, and the relative importance of those things might differ depending on what species you're talking about or where you are. But in general, um, this is a video, and I apologize, it's a little bit dark. And it's quiet also. You could hear that better. You'd hear more bird song. And what you wouldn't hear is wind. And um, first thing in the morning, what we tend to have cool air, we tend to have more humid air, and we had to have, tend to have calmer winds. And all those things are really good at transmitting sound over longer distances. And it turns out that if you were aiming to communicate as a bird, and you don't happen to have, say, a microphone to transmit over a broader area, then choosing to sing at a time of day when the air is naturally serving as a microphone, as it does first thing in the morning, is a really good thing for reaching a, a, a wider number of potential individuals that might hear that song. The other thing is that at daybreak, just as at like dusk, daybreak is one of those times of days that can be quite risky. Um, it, you might think a bird wakes up, it's gonna need to forage right away. When that light isn't very good, it might be harder to find food, but it's also a, quite a risky time as far as getting eaten by other things. Dawn and dusk are what I call the biting hour, the time when the mosquitoes come out and get you, but also the predators often make kills around that time. And um, a bird might choose to sing, which is relatively not risky, than foraging where its attention is uh, distracted from looking for predators instead of looking for food. So it's a combination of the sound transmission and the costs and benefits of doing these different things that are part of its daily activities. <clears throat> okay, it's daybreak deer, time to sing. Who are these birds really communicating with and what are they trying to tell them? Song, it turns out, has two main functions. And by song, um, the primary song of, vocal, of, of song birds. And so this is a bird that you might recognize from around your own homes. It's Carolina wren, frequents backyards in urban areas in, in Kansas. Um, and um, here's what it sounds like, and here's what it's saying. different individuals sing a variety of these different songs and often when you hear one and they're often very loud too um, you might hear another one singing from somebody else's backyard and um, that's no mistake there's not that's not a just chance these birds are often communicating with song males typically although females too to claim a territory to say this is mine 
don't come to this yard because it's taken. You'll waste your time. You'll waste your energy. We're just going to have to fight. I'd rather not fight. I'd rather just let you know that this is mine and stay away. And that other individual is saying, yeah, and this is mine. So don't try to like encroach on mine either. And it turns out that when birds hear a familiar song, a neighbor who they know, aggression is very low. They don't tend to like contest those boundaries very much. But when they hear a different individual, they will actually um, uh, go after them and exert energy in trying to like keep those intruders out. And as biologists, we actually get to take advantage of that. This is something that my husband told me that I needed to tell you, is that um, when we're trying to catch birds, we can take advantage of that aggression against an unknown intruder by actually placing a little speaker at the base of the nets that we use to capture the birds and playing their song. And these birds think that there's some territory intruder come into the middle of their territory who they have to whoop. And so they lose it and fly into the net and we get to capture them, which is very satisfying. Um, you'd think they'd, they definitely see the nets on the middle of the prairie, but they, their hormones get the better of them. So that's one main function. It's males basically saying, stay away. The second main function is to attract mates. And although I told you before that prairie chickens don't really sing song functions the way that those male prairie chickens do to, to impress a female. And so here's a female showing up to evaluate a couple of different males. And those males, when they're making those weird sounds, they're like, hey, baby, you know, like these orange pouches are really amazing, aren't they? And like my ear tufts are better than that other guy's ear tufts and you should pick me. So that's the other main communication function of song is to, to impress and attract um, potential mates. Now, I mentioned before, birds do more than just song, and even the songbirds do a lot of other vocalizations. So <clears throat> um, sometimes those, those other vocalizations serve a whole bunch <coughs> of different functions. And um, for instance, this, <coughs> sorry, blackbird. <coughs> vocalizations, calls, other, call, <coughs> other types of um, audio signals that birds make function to communicate to group members where there's good foraging or locate family members or say, I think it's time to go or warning, there's a hawk, look out. Um, so vocalizations generally serve a whole ton of different functions and most birds have multiple different kinds of vocalizations that they make in addition to sort of those <clears throat> primary songs that they might make. <clears throat> Sorry, I drank something the wrong way. <clears throat> so that gives a bit of insight into where my brain goes, the weird rabbit holes that a biologist goes down when you read just an innocent title of an exhibition. Um, and the reason that my brain goes there is because I spent so much of my time trying to figure out how these little birds on the prairie make decisions, what goes through their head, what's important to them, what are good conditions for them, and what are bad conditions. And so I thought I'd share a little bit of some of the, just a few of the main insights of things that we've learned about, about these birds in, in my lab. <clears throat> One of the coolest things, um, I'm really interested in movement, and it turns out that these prairie songbirds are very special in the amount that they move around. So they, and they move around more than most. They move around more than most um, forest dwelling birds, for instance. So we'll start with something that you probably are familiar with, um, annual return migrations. So if we can picture like a breeding range, um, Great Plains, bird nests there in the spring and summer, during the fall, a little bit before now, and during now they'll move down to a non-breeding range. And in the spring they move back again. So when we use the word migration in the bird world, we typically refer to those cyclical annual movements. And um, even in a single place, like the Kansa Prairie that I've marked um, with that red dot, which is a, a 
reserve near to Manhattan, Kansas. If you look at the prairie, the grassland dependent breeding birds there, the migrants, they move, they have this huge diversity of movement patterns and movement schedules. So for some of them, like the grasshopper sparrow, which is a bird that I've studied a lot, they move relatively short distances. They'll move down to the Gulf Coast or Northern Mexico to spend the non-breeding season, staying within North America. Others, like the dick thistle, skip over the temp, you know, skip over the whole Gulf, go skip over Central America and go all the way to Northern South America and spend their winters in grasslands and places that kind of resemble the Everglades in like, northern Venezuela, and in some places they're actually agricultural pests on rice crops down there during the winter. <clears throat> then there's others that do something even more impressive, because I'm pretty blown away by the, the dick thistles, but upland sandpipers are crazy. So they not only fall across the Gulf, one big flight, they'll cross the uh, Isthmus of Tehuantepec, that skinny part of Mexico, they cross the Andes twice. They'll fly all the way past the vast Amazonian forests, all the way until they reach grasslands in the southern temperate zone. So the grasslands that look a lot like our Kansas areas in northern Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay. And they spend the winter chilling out in those grasslands, not breeding or anything like that. They do that all over again to come back again and breed. And a single individual might do that incredible journey multiple times during its life, six, seven, eight times, moving across this huge, huge gradient and how they do that and how they find their way and all those things are endlessly fascinating to, to me as a biologist. But um, although we know a lot about where on average like the whole species might go, we don't know an awful lot about the actual migration schedules, when they leave, where they stop along the way, what kinds of places are important for them to like refuel, like where are their gas stations basically, um, how many gas stations do they even need. And so one of the ways we're studying this is by putting these little, these little tags on the back of grasshopper sparrows. Those are called top left corner there, they're called geolocators. And what they do is measure time and light. And so it turns out that if you know sunrise time and sunset time, and you, and you know which day of the year it is, then you can, I wouldn't say pinpoint, but you can get within a couple of hundred kilometers, uh, one to 300 kilometer radius of where that bird is. And you can create migration maps if you get that device back again, such as you see in the bottom left. So you can see this individual um, we captured on the 23rd of July, 2017, and it spent a whole bunch of time at Kanza, which is why that is such a bright red zone there. And then um, starting in early September, it started moving south, and it used three different stopover places in Oklahoma on its way south spent a bunch of time at three different places and then pretty much motored all the way south to uh, the Gulf Coast of Texas near Brownsville where it spent the rest of the winter. We had to get that tag back again to get that information, but each one of those tags that we get back provides this rich information about how an individual moves, when it moves, where it goes, and by getting multiple tags back, like that from various individuals. We know that our little Kanza sparrows, some of them do that. Some of them go over to like the Big Bend area of Texas. Others go all the way to Southern Arizona to breed, to winter. So it's not like all the birds from one area are going to one specific wintering area, but they're spreading out to a bunch of different wintering areas. And that helps us know that when we see declines locally, it's not due to one specific thing that happens on the wintering grounds because we wouldn't expect it to happen across the board. We've learned other things about their movement. Um, and I'm going to tell you about some of the other movements that birds make. So we know that, for instance, during the breeding season, they'll move around locally. They'll move around within their home range. Then a baby bird 
will move from where it first breeds or where it was born to where it first breeds and that's called natal dispersal and pretty much all birds do that. And then for most migrants, once they find a good place to breed, they'll just keep doing their migrations and come back to that exact same spot. But our birds are special. Our birds do more. They'll move, they'll breed in one place one year and then they disappear and others show up. And so they're making what we call breeding dispersal movements from where they breed in one year to where they breed in the next year. And we know that only about 20% of the individuals that breed in our prairies ever come back the next year to breed again. And they're all replaced by other individuals. And we know that, so there's a lot of movement going around there, uh, going on. And I wanted to know why they do that. And the answer to that is partly dependent on the spatial scale over which they're making those movements. So if you can picture a bird bred maybe on the left and it comes back in the spring, it finds it totally burnt, okay? Um, we'll talk about fire later, but does it make a decision to just sort of hop over the fence or go to another pasture that wasn't burnt that year? So management decisions, or does it decide to go somewhere quite different that would implicate maybe the variability of our, our weather systems and, and patterns of drought and, and rainfall on, in the region. So we did this cool thing using the biochemical signature in feathers to tell us where birds bred last year when they came back to Kanza. And what we found out that it's actually these long distance movements that they're making by and large. So when we see new individuals coming in, it's most likely that they came from a state away um, from where they bred last year compared to where they're breeding this year, which is kind of amazing. Um, and that is incredibly um, unusual and something that I think is quite special about our, our prairie birds. So while we're doing that, we actually discovered something kind of even more unusual which is that in addition to moving around with between years, um, they move around a lot within years too. So we catch the birds, like I said, and we put these little color bands. You can see um, the bird's left leg here in this picture has two yellow bands, but we use four different colors. One's a numbered band, a metal band, and then two, um, one other colored band um, with the metal band and then two color bands. So every bird, gets its own combination, that's their name, we call them like blue, yellow, dash, silver, pink, you know, that's that's a reasonable name for a sparrow. And so you can see those, those colors. Um, and that represents real map of where real territorial individuals were on a little piece of the Kanza in May of 2014. Well, we go back and look for those individuals repeatedly, like every week over the breeding season. And what we found is after about a month, some of those marked individuals were showing up somewhere else. Some of them disappeared entirely. And some of the places that we had territorial color banded individuals had been replaced by new individuals. And so they're moving around within season. They're doing this within season dispersal. And it turns out that some at least half of the birds are making those kinds of movements within season every year. And what we think happens is that they breed, maybe they're successful. Um, the breeding season is long enough here that they can have another breeding attempt. The prairies are changing through this whole period, right? You've seen how grass grows, how the, the different things come into bloom, the, um, the the landscape transforms over from May to say July. And so um, as birds initiate new nests, they're picking new spots in the landscape to, to, to start those new nests. And, and, and the males are also moving because they're going to places where they think that they will be successful in attracting those females. Um, so a lot of that first work that we did in this system really highlighted how incredibly mobile these birds are and how they're really flexible. They're making decisions all the time on the fly. Ha <laughs> um, uh, And we then started to delve into like, why are they doing that? And a lot of the work that we do now 
examines the kinds of variability that we think is driving those movements. A big element of variability in this part of the world is the weather, right? I hope I see some nods there because if you've lived in Kansas even for a couple of years, you'll know how it can be like last year in February, it was incredibly awfully cold for a really long time, right? I hate the cold even though I'm Canadian. And I remember a couple of Februarys ago when it was so warm, we had this party for back in the day when we can have parties, we opened the windows because it was so warm. Um, from one year to the next, it can be hot, can be cold, can also be rainy or wet, right? And that, especially that rainfall element, we think is really important for shaping the vegetation, the structure of the vegetation, the potentially the forage, foraging opportunities for those birds and the nesting opportunities and affecting where they choose to go from one year to the next. There are two other really important elements of variability though too in this landscape that have more to do with the spatial aspect of variability. So one of those is fire. Fire has been part of this ecosystem forever. Um, fire is necessary to maintain grasslands in a place like Eastern Kansas that gets quite a lot of rain. If we don't burn it, what happens is we get Eastern red cedars, filling up areas in the prairie, other shrubs, other trees, and the grassland dependent birds really hate that. They really, really, really hate trees. Um, and so um, the fire is crucial for removing the woody vegetation. It's also creates this patchiness of the structure of the, of the grasses and, and the um, other, the forbs um, that make up grasslands. Um, and so some often that burned areas are really great places to feed because when it burns, nitrogen goes back to the soil, to the roots, the grasses are more nutritious, the bugs that feed on those are, are really tasty. Um, and, but then um, a burned open area isn't a very good place to hide a nest. And most of these birds are putting their nests on the ground where they're, they really care about trying to hide them from predators because predators are bad. Um, so fire creates this patchiness. The, at even smaller scales, the grazing of large ungulates is really patchy and really important for these birds. So historically, big herds of bison and other grazers um, foraged across this landscape, but not uniformly. They, some areas would get really hammered, uh, then there would be other areas that were relatively un, um, uh, un, unchewed. <laughs> um, and so on very fine spatial scales, birds use that patchiness for, for different activities, for hiding, for nesting, for foraging. And then on large spatial scales, those grazers are also responding to the the climate, the, the rain and the fire. And so all that variability is what makes our grassland birds tick and what makes their movements happen and also is contributing to the difficulty of keeping them healthy now. And so that leads into, um, unfortunately, another really important thing I want to take you to take away from this and hope actually probably the most important thing to take away is that grassland birds are the most threatened group of birds in North America today. What other better bird to exemplify that than prairie chickens? And I, I regretfully tell my students um, that they need to go and see prairie chickens lacking in, in March and April because um, this is probably the last generation that is going to be able to see that, I'm afraid. Um, I don't have a particularly optimistic view of what's going to happen to prairie chickens. But it's not just chickens. So two years ago, a group of very influential scientists amalgamated um, the best information they could to look at how many birds we've lost in North America over the past five decades. And they found an astounding loss of birds. Um, among the different guilds, the birds that like uh, wetlands seem to be doing okay, thanks mainly to hunters, Ducks Unlimited. Thank you, folks. Um, 
Grassland birds are the group that are declining most rapidly, most number of species, most numbers lost. And this is a really, really scary thing. So um, over 50% of the species uh, are declining and some are declining incredibly fast. In case you think that, well, in Eastern Kansas, we're doing a good job, this is fine, it's a problem of other people in other places, it's not, I'm afraid, limited there. And that actually plays into this whole mobility thing because what we do in one place is great, but when a lot of our population is using the entire Great Plains and using Northern Mexico, what happens elsewhere affects our birds too. Um, so even in the, in Conza Prairie, which is this, where this beautiful picture is taken, these are data that I've analyzed um, in our lab of trends in the abundance of grasshopper sparrows. And you can see the grazing areas in blue. They're doing okay, they're about steady. In the pink areas, they're declining um, in areas that are not grazed, unlike some species like dick thistles that are more tolerant of shrubs. And so that's one of the many pieces of evidence that we think um, implicates sort of changes in the way the land is managed and the changes in the vegetation structure and community that's, that's driving these changes, even in relatively well-protected, beautiful prairies. Okay. Phew. So my title was A Prairie Bird's Love-Hate Relationship with Humans. And um, all that leads into why these birds would hate humans. Um, <clears throat> I've alluded to a lot of this before, but we're going to hammer it in home as, as well as we can. The main reason they might hate us is because we have led to the destruction of so much grasslands. And it kind of depends on how you measure it, whether you just look at tall grass prairies or all central grasslands, but an astounding proportion, somewhere between 70 and 90 percent um, of grasslands have been lost. And when we say lost, um, the majority of that have been converted to agriculture. Um, in the Homestead Act of um, 1862, I believe, um, this park in Nebraska commemorates that, that Homestead Act. Um, and it commemorates it in physical form that's a, uh, mimicking the shape of a plow. The plow came in, settlers must were re obligated to plow to maintain that land. It was called improving the land. Um, as they plowed it under, we lost the grass. Um, when we lost the grass, we lost the fire regimes. Um, as it got plowed under, we also got fences. Um, fences were one of the things that um, made it difficult for bison to do what bison had already done. And then, of course, the railway came in, and um, that, along with a systematic program of extermination of bison to make life difficult for Native peoples um, and make it easier for settlers to take up this area, um, almost led to the extinction of bison. This is a huge heap of bison skulls um, that, to me, just sums up that tragedy. Luckily, bison were not driven to extinction at that point, but I would argue that their function in the ecosystem is extinct. Their movements are extinct. Their behavior is only permitted to occur within fairly narrow confines of what we as humans think is acceptable. And it's an inevitable fact of our society that we all have to grapple with. Um, in case you think, though, that prairie loss is something that happened uh, a long time ago and um, is not a problem today, it unfortunately is ongoing. So. Uh, I think starting about a decade ago, the World Wildlife Fund started producing at regular intervals these what they called the plow print reports, which quantified how much native grassland is being lost every single year and visualizing that on a map. 
And so you can go to that map and, and look at your favorite area. Um, I want to, before we do that, I wanted to pull out this quote um, from the most recent plow print report from 2018 to 2019, an estimated 2.6 million acres of grassland were plowed up primarily to make way for row crop agriculture. And the majority of that grows cereal grains and a lot of that cereal grain feeds animals that we then eat. Um, that area, in case it's difficult for you to assimilate because numbers like that are kind of meaningless to me, that's a little bit under the size of Yellowstone National Park. And the bad news is that number is getting bigger each year. So the amount of new area converted from grassland to something else is increasing each year. Um, some of that's, of course, a lot of that's plowed up. It's not all. Urban, urban expansion is, is a big deal. Um, and um, other thing, industrial developments like massive solar installations by power companies. Um, it's, people see grasslands and they think empty, not useful. Grasslands are not that. Um, so I hope you want to take that away. This is an image from the plow print maps. Um, and I just zoomed in on a place where we can see both Manhattan and Wichita marked there. And everything in green is native grassland and everything in that gold color are, are crop fields. And so they quantify that change pixel by pixel every single year um, to tell us where and when and how grasslands are being lost. A lot of the expansion of, gra of, of agriculture in recent years has gone on in relatively arid areas where central pivot agriculture has made, that, that irrigation has made it possible to grow crops in places that were formerly not economically viable. So unfortunately, this is what most of the Great Plains looks like and listens like, sounds like. And if you could hear the video a little bit better, you would be able to hear that in addition to static, there's um, crickets and no bird song. Um, so although agricultural areas are used occasionally, they can be a, a refuge during certain circumstances. They can occasionally be used for nesting. They're generally not viable habitat for grassland birds. So I know that was super depressing. Um, we're going to get now to the love part. Why would prairie birds love humans given all this awful stuff that's happened that we've done to their their habitat and, and the grassland landscapes. Well, prairie birds depend on us. They depend on grass-fed cattle, and they depend on the people who manage those lands. So the vast majority of remaining uh, grasslands in the Central Great Plains are privately owned, especially tall grass prairies. They aren't in private reserves. Private reserves are way too small and will never be big enough to, per, to preserve viable populations of these bird species. The future of our birds depends on ranchers, depends on the decisions that ranchers make about the way they manage their lands, and it depends on its staying ranch. And so a very good way that you can support grassland birds, if you like meat, is to purchase grass-fed cattle, not, not cattle that's gone to feedlots and being fed up on grain that's being grown in, in areas that are being plowed up prairie, but cattle that have actually foraged on prairie. That's probably the most sustainable thing that you can eat as a, as a Kansan. Um, I'm actually allergic to meat, so I can't do that, but um, <laughs> uh, it turns out that cattle do many of the things uh, that bison did almost as well. Um, they create that fine scale heterogeneity in the landscape, in the structure of the vegetation, as long as it's not overgrazed. They're doing just as good a job providing that variability that the grassland birds need. And so supporting our ranchers 
um, and supporting grass-fed cattle is a huge thing that you can do. And it's the future of our birds depends on them. And so we need to support that. Another thing that those ranchers do is that they set fire. And um, maintaining that patchy fire on the landscape is critical, as I said before. So those fires that ranchers set, typically in the spring, and I know it screws up the water, the air quality for people, um, which is unfortunate, but that is very important. Um, uh, our fires are probably different from historical fires that were either uncontrolled but set by Native American people or lightning strikes in the summer. Nowadays, our fires are more controlled, probably smaller, probably less patchy, probably cooler because we burn on days where they don't want them to get away from. So under cool, calm, moist conditions, which lead to cooler fire, but they still are very effective at creating the kind of patchiness on the landscape that our birds depend upon. Our grassland birds also depend on you. So along with that really depressing paper that I mentioned earlier that came out with graphics like this, like we've lost three and four Eastern meadowlarks since the 1970s, um, there was also a public education campaign about things that you can do. And they came up with seven simple things that everybody can do in their daily lives to make life better, not only for grassland birds, but for all birds. And so those include um, making windows safer. So uh, part of that can be in cities, lights out during migration, in your own homes, putting decals up to prevent window collisions. Um, second thing, keep your cats inside and don't subsidize feral cat populations. Cats are not native um, and I love cats. I have two cats of my own. They're very happy inside. They're healthy inside and they don't eat birds. Um, uh, you can do things on your own properties as far as landscaping. So using native plants as much as you possibly can, re eliminating, replacing lawns with more diverse plantings that aren't mowed regularly, that provide refuge for native uh, insects, pollinators, um, things that provide good food for, for birds is, is very useful. Eliminating or re drastically reducing the amount of chemicals that you use in your daily life, especially outdoors. Pesticides are terrible. Um, um, just live with some, some you know, produce loss in your garden and, and enjoy the fact that you're eating organic when you do so. Uh, you can also um, minimize or eliminate, if you can, um, your use of plastics, particularly single-use plastics. Those little straws and spoons they give you at Brahms or the takeout cups from, from you know, Starbucks, just don't do that. Bring your own. Um, and uh, you can also, this is a little bit more obscure, but you can drink shade-grown coffee, and that greatly benefits, especially our woodland birds that winter in neotropical forests. And it turns out that they depend on a lot of these sort of margins of forests that are often in coffee plantations. So buying shade-grown coffee, you can look up, you can Google bird-friendly coffee and, and, and order um, bird-friendly coffee or go to, um, there's some like maybe Sprouts or Whole Foods, I'm not sure. Um, sells that kind of stuff as well. And then finally, do citizen science. Get out, look at birds, report your bird sightings. All those sightings feed back into the data streams that we as scientists use to understand how bird populations are changing. And it also helps engage you with nature and helps you educate others about the value of it. <clears throat> so in addition to trying to make all those right decisions in my own personal life, I do other things as well. Um, my job is in large part research, and uh, I try to tackle questions to answer these big questions that we have still that will help conservation of grassland birds. Where do they go? Where are they most vulnerable? What kinds of management actions will 
increase the life stage, the survival of the life stages that are most vulnerable, those kinds of things. On the left, you can see a student being trained to take a bird out of a mist net. Like I mentioned, that's where we put the little playback, um, we catch them in those nets. And on the right, you can see a tower that was installed this summer on Kanza Prairie that will detect little radio signals from birds carrying backpacks with little tags so we know who's using the Flint Hills and when and how many, where they're coming from, how the Flint Hills plays into the migration at a continental scale. Another huge part of my job I see as talking about what we do as scientists and talking to people like you today uh, about why this is so important um, and teaching that to my students. So in addition to doing things like this, we have also as a lab, as a whole group of students um, and myself have produced some videos on, that we put on YouTube about the prairies, about the birds, about why it's special, about the research we do and, and why we do it. Um, you can Google, you can look, go to YouTube, find the Boyle Lab and, and look at some of those later if you like. And then I also try to make sure that what we find out as scientists gets into the hands of the people who make the decisions on the ground, the conservation practitioners. And so one of the main ways I'm doing that now is but I'm part of a steering committee for this Central Grassland Roadmap Initiative that started actually two years ago, is ongoing, and is a tri-national um, effort to coordinate landowners, ranchers, um, indigenous groups, governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, academics, all these interested parties to envision and bring about the healthy, connected grassland landscape across the entire Great Plains over the next couple decades. And it's so overwhelming sometimes, but it's also so incredibly exciting. And it's the only way that we are going to achieve conservation on this scale, which is what we need given the mobility of these birds. So <clears throat> I've talked to you a lot about what grasslands and birds and bird-human interactions mean to me as a scientist, but we're at an art gallery and I want to end with the proposition that birds depend on us, but we actually depend on them maybe to the same extent. We've seen around us, if you open your eyes to it, you see birds, representational images of birds in every kind of visual art form you might find, you might look for um, in crafts, in children's drawings, in um, um, cave paintings such as this. Now this is an incredibly important one because it shows that humans have been inspired by birds for millennia. This is a quite accurate depiction of a species from Australia that went extinct 40,000 years ago. Humans back then, when that bird was not extinct, were being inspired by birds. And birds inspire us in abstract ways, not only the visual arts, but they are symbols of freedom and fragility and beauty. And they, and transients too. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And so um, that inspires me as an artist, as well as a, as a scientist. And I started by saying that I started my career as a musician. I continue to be a musician. And together with my husband, who's here today, we developed a program of, of music that celebrates the birds, the places, the people of the Great Plains um, through works of music of others and also works that we've um, written ourselves. And so I'm gonna, um, play one of those now. It's a piece that we've, that I composed based, inspired by Eastern Meadowlarks that I started this talk with. Um, and inspired also by being out on the prairie in the morning at daybreak and seeing that happen. So this is gate five. And
Thank you for listening. There are many people who've helped make the work possible. And um, just in case you want to follow up on anything here, here are a few links that you might want to check out for later. That's all I have. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions from anybody who might have them. Yes, sir. Thank you. Who is a student? A friend of mine who is a student here uh, did some research in a paper on uh, cat predation on songbirds, and it's just devastating. The her most prolific killer she found was actually a cat that had been declawed. They kill by, uh, they kill nestlings. Their ability to catch uh, adult birds is limited, but they kill nestlings. And of course the grassland birds, that's where they, that's where they nest, right in the grass, very accessible to the cats. And you can't do anything about it other than keep them indoors. Cats, that's their nature, they're killers. I love cats too, but it's what they do. And so I'm a member of the American Bird Conservancy and also Nature Conservancy. And I know how important all this is. So this is wonderful. This was a, this was a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, it People. I don't. Yeah. Okay. This is a debate that is is quite acrimonious, and I'd be happy to talk to both of you later about it. But um, but thank you for that that commentary. Go ahead. Uh, does, the, uh, does the impact of the wind turbines affect this? Is there something about that? The other thing is being Canadian, you say A. A? <laughs> I am Canadian, eh? But um, <clears throat> uh, wind turbines, the question is, do wind turbines affect um, bird populations? Uh, Yes, a little bit. Um, probably less direct mortality than avoidance of wind of areas with wind turbines. There have been some studies with prairie chickens that have shown that just like trees, they don't really like tall things on the landscape, and so they're scared of them. Um, um, wind turbines do kill some birds, but they're way worse for bats. Um, migrant bats are, but there are actually many ways to mitigate that. Um, if you sometimes see wind turbines that aren't turning and their blades have been feathered, there are excellent migration forecast maps based on radar and based on when we know birds are going to be in, and bats are going to be moving. And it's quite possible to basically just turn them off during those high risk nights. Sometimes. Yes. Windows? Yes. Yeah. The question is about how to make the windows safer and um, in particular about how, when to do it and how to do that. And um, uh, the most, so the Lights Out initiative uh, is aimed at reducing migration mortality. So um, fall and spring, uh, huge numbers of songbirds are migrating at night. Um, that's something I didn't mention, but a lot of these little birds that are completely 
diurnal. They, you know, they don't do anything at night normally. When it comes time to migrate, they migrate at night. And it, again, it has to do with cool, calm, moist air. Um, and those are more efficient conditions to fly under. And um, so a lot of them are moving at night and are disrupted by human light and uh, crash into buildings, are attracted to light and crash into them um, when those lights are left on. So the crucial times, I mean, I would argue that there's never a good reason to leave lights on in, in office buildings at night. Um, so I don't really see a need to keep them on at night uh, um, all the time. There's lots of sort of motion sensor things that people can put on, on, on building lights that will turn them off when they're not needed. But the crucial times, I would say, in this part of the world um, are April and May and August and September. A little bit in October, but September is the big month, and April is probably the big month in the spring. Um, now, as far as making your own home or new building construction safer, there are lots of different ways to do that. There's um, there if you're building a home, if you're building a building for new for from scratch. Um, even one of the, my favorite solutions is simply changing the angle instead of making it completely vertical, tilting it down a bit and minimizing the extent to which the, the, this, it'll reflect sky. Um, another way is window, is bird friendly window. There's glass that has micro patterns in it that they can see. Uh, there are UV reflectant decals that you can stick on your own windows that are very low tech and birds see in UV. We can look through them it'll be much more of a contrast to, to the bird than it is to us because we don't see the full spectrum of light that they do. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. Any other questions? Or if you want, I'm going to stick around for the reception too. So if you'd like to ask a question then or talk about something else. One more. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I wish I could say they were super important. I'm not absolutely convinced they are. I mean, they certainly provide, um, they eat a lot of bugs. So if there weren't any birds, a lot more of the grass would be consumed by grasshoppers and, and um, you know, larvae, the, you know, butterfly and moth larvae um, in particular. But, um, and that's actually potentially a big amount of forage area of volume that's removed by insects and bird predation on those insects is probably the biggest effect. Um, there are some very cool examples of, of interactions with other species like um, picking off parasites. Some birds will pick off parasites of, of grazing animals. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, those probably aren't hugely important. Okay, well, thank you very much.